I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. I'm James R. Copeland, the director of the Center for Legal Policy at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today to our forum on overcriminalizing the Empire State, criminal law trends in New York and the threat to liberty and commerce. Um, I, I trust that those of you who are seeking CLE credits signed in when you came in, you'll also have to sign out upon exit and, and get your certificate. Um, I'd like to thank at the outset uh, my colleague Isaac Gorodetsky uh, for putting together this amazing panel and, uh, and, and keynote today, as well as making all the CLE arrangements, as well as our uh, fantastic event staff uh, headed by Taisha Camacho, who've made this thing go seamlessly this morning. I'd also like to ask everyone before we start to make sure you've turned off your cell phones and beepers so you're not going to interrupt uh, any of our outstanding speakers this morning. Our topic today is overcriminalization, uh, specifically applied to New York. And so at the very beginning, before we brought our keynote uh, speaker up, I wanted to just sort of try to frame that issue and, and talk about what do we mean when we say overcriminalization. And folks mean different things, frankly, when they talk about this subject, uh, depending on what their point of view is and what their area of focus is. At the outset, it's, it's to some degree the, the, the broad prolifer proliferation of statutes uh, that, that encompass the criminal law. Uh, today's criminal law goes far beyond uh, what we think of as the traditional common law crimes, the, the, the core crimes, so to speak, rape, murder, assault, burglary, and what have you. Uh, and it's the reach of those statutes beyond traditional criminal law bounds that many people talk about when they speak of overcriminalization. Both the substance uh, of, of the crimes, the, 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 the number of regulatory crimes, uh, which, is, which is to some degree a, a, a relatively new phenomenon. It's about a century old that the Supreme Court uh, passed muster on, on the regulatory state uh, incorporating crimes, and also in scope. And particularly what I've focused on is, for instance, the application of the criminal law to corporate defendants, uh, something which uh, has a long history but quite a limited one, uh, was certainly disfavored in Blackstone, and again dates about a century, 102 years, to when the Supreme Court uh, first gave constitu a constitutional green light to this, at least in the federal context. Uh, another, other key areas of focus when we talk about overcriminalization are statutory vagueness and ambiguity, not giving fair notice uh, of, of what's criminal uh, based on open-ended statutes vested in prosecutorial discretion, and the erosion of mens rea, which for those of you who aren't lawyers in the audience is, 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 is a guilty mind uh, intent. It's sort of, uh, it, it's a guilty mind. It's a legal construct, but it's the, the, the erosion of intent in the criminal law such that accident, negligence, mistake can, can in, in many cases lead to criminal prosecution today. Now there are other issues that fall somewhat under this umbrella that folks focus on a lot. Uh, one is, is the question of punishment. So we might talk of over-punishment. A lot of crimes, the, the sentences keep getting longer and longer. At the federal level, we have the federal sentencing guidelines, mandatory minimums, three strikes or outlaws, and what have you. Various folks are, are significantly concerned by these developments. Uh, we also have uh, issues of federalism, and so a lot of, of talk, we've had a couple congressional hearings on this topic looking at over federal, the over-federalization of criminal law, the growth of, of uh, the federal government's role. That being said, 90 percent of criminal prosecutions are, are still at state and local level, over 90 percent, and, and that's sort of, to some degree the inverse of what we're focusing on today, which is the state level concerns here in New York. 
at the outset, it's a little strange to think we have an overcriminalization problem in the U.S. I, I clearly, our constitutional framers were uh, deeply concerned about criminal law overreach. If you look at the, the Bill of Rights, uh, the first eight amendments, uh, which, which aren't the catch-all amendments, four of those uh, involve criminal law in, in some respect. Now, it's important, and, and many of these treasured rights that we take for granted, from the right to counsel, the right to a jury trial, a grand jury, the right to confront witnesses, the right against self-incrimination, these are embedded in our Constitution. Uh, but, but it's notable that of those four amendments, uh, three of them are, are solely procedural in nature, and the only real substantive overlay in the Bill of Rights uh, to criminal law is, is the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And, and Dan Richman, who we'll, we'll hear from later, has, has written on this. There's an outstanding article in the packet talking about how this focus on procedure uh, led to, to effectively no substantive delineation in the Constitution on what constitutes criminal law. And, and he talks about the political economy, the overlap between uh, our tendency to have general prosecutors and courts uh, that, that, that basically handle all criminal matters, uh, the lack of, of detailed regulatory structures that are separate from that, separating out from the core crimes, and of course the political gains uh, that accrue both to prosecutors and to legislators from adding more and more things uh, as crimes. So we have a very discretionary system uh, of criminal enforcement in the U.S. And, and there are really three principles that I draw out here that I've focused on in my writings that my colleagues have and, and that, that I hope we'll get to some today. Uh, one is the erosion of the rule of law. Uh, the, the principle that we have predictable rules where like cases are treated alike. I think the proliferation of statutes uh, creating crimes and the substantial discretion vested upon prosecutors uh, erodes basic rule of law principles. Second is the principle of, of notice. Uh, this is embedded in our common law tradition through what lawyers call the rules of legality and lenity, the, the principle that you're on notice of your crime and in fact if there's a vague or ambig ambiguous statute, the courts will construe it favorably to the criminal defendant because you're supposed to know what's criminal in advance. But with the broad proliferation of our crimes and the vagueness and ambiguity in many modern criminal statutes, uh, we're really not on effective notice of what might be criminal. And then third, this erosion of intent in the criminal law or a guilty mind, which has dovetailed uh, with the expansion of the regulatory state using criminal law as a significant, if not primary, enforcement apparatus. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, New York and the principles here. Uh, I've got a chapter that I wrote on this topic uh, for the Heritage Foundation's book, uh, One Nation Under Arrest. I, you can look at that in your packet if you're more interested. But, but really on all these scores, uh, New York scores rather poorly uh, if you're concerned about the things I've, I've articulated uh, at the outset. Uh, first, when it comes to intent, New York uh, definitionally makes strict liability a potential crime in New York Penal Law 15.10. Um, secondly, when we talk about proliferation uh, of, of laws, um, New York has, has really just a, a broad uh, panoply of laws well outside the penal code that create crimes. In fact, uh, based on the most recent counts I've been able to do and, and, and check, there's 65 areas of the consolidated laws and an additional, additional eight areas in the unconsolidated laws in New York uh, that create crimes. I included in these are the laws governing arts and cultural affairs, domestic relations, education, estates, powers, and trusts, highway, lost and strayed animals, and the Volunteer Firefighters Benefit Law. Um, in addition to this, New York law incorporates by reference uh, the entire bodies of regulation created under certain of the laws so that the, the state legislators aren't necessarily voting on these laws that are creating crimes, but rather every regulatory infraction of certain laws is presumptively a crime. Uh, these include the Environmental Conservation Law, 
the agriculture and markets law, agricultural and markets law, the insurance law, and the labor law. Now, the penalties for these tend to be minor. These aren't felony offenses, of course, that are created from regulatory breaches. They're misdemeanors in the environmental law. They're violations. Uh, but, but, but the way these are structured can often create significant real criminal penalties, at least in theory, for prosecutors to wield uh, in, in going after uh, uh, crimes that they're, they're, they're trying to prosecute as, as regulatory violations. For instance, in the environmental conservation law, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a violation punishable by up to five days in prison for any one day uh, someone breaches the law. So if someone breached the law for a year, uh, they could they could spend a number of years in prison uh, on the basis of, of the, the, the strict letter of the law there. Now, what, what I'm going to focus on for, for the conclusion of my opening remarks and what our panelists, at least two of them, are going to focus on substantially uh, is, is a particular area of New York law with very broad scope uh, and substance that, that's been substantially in the press, and that's the Martin Act, Section 352 of the General Business Law, uh, originally known as a blue sky law when it was written in 1921, and the 1926 Court of Appeals decision that you'll see in your packets uh, specifically uh, refers to it as the Martin Act or the blue sky laws, and was for the vast majority of its history used solely to go after boiler rooms and Ponzi schemes, basically uh, the, the sorts of, of activities where, where uh, traders are pushing uh, fictitious or, or bogus securities on unsuspecting consumers. Uh, the, the, the law was originally only civil. It was expanded in 1955 uh, to include criminal enforcement authority, and then that became felony criminal enforcement authority in 1982. Uh, the Martin Act is notable for uh, various features that make it far broader uh, than the, the federal securities law and most state securities laws as applied. First, there's no requirement of any intent to defraud. Secondly, there's no requirement that any investor uh, had to rely on, on uh, alleged frauds. Third, there's no requirement of any injury. And fourth, there's no requirement even of any purchase or sale of securities to, to trigger a Martin Act violation. Uh, the, the actual substance of the law also includes rather sweeping uh, condemnations of what normally would be thought of as, as mere forward-looking statements. For instance, uh, it, 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 it makes a, it's a violation of the Martin Act for any prom to, to have any promise or representation as to the future which is beyond reasonable expectation or unwarranted by existing circumstances. Uh, clearly something this sweeping means that uh, any corporate executive speaking about uh, his or her company's prospects is uh, effectively running the risk of, of uh, being prosecuted for a, a mere mistake. In addition to its criminal provisions, the Martin Act has sweeping civil subpoena power vested solely with the state attorney general. It's a crime not to comply with this uh, uh, civil subpoena power. It creates a prima facie a presumption of criminal guilt if you don't comply with the subpoena power. And there are no privacy protections. The AG has full discretion on whether to disclose anything that he uncovers in this uh, civil subpoena. And so it's the interplay, because the, the criminal sanctions are actually rather low, as, as Mike Miller uh, has written about and might talk about later on the panel under the Martin Act. That being said, a uh, criminal conviction for companies can create substantial collateral consequences. Uh, a securities firm, for instance, might lose the right to trade on exchanges and what have you. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, the companies are going to be uh, very uh, hesitant to go uh, up against uh, a, a potential criminal prosecution under the Martin Act, particularly given the breadth uh, of substantive offense uh, that, that, that's contained under the statute. And uh, it, 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 it's all, it, I want to talk finally about uh, some of the trends we've seen under the Martin Act. These have been in the headlines and some of the pushes to try to expand the Martin Act that we've, we've heard about, and then I'll introduce our keynote speaker. Um, the trends, of course, we've all heard about Elliot Spitzer, the, the, his assault on Wall Street firms, investment banking industry, the mutual fund industry, the insurance industry. Uh, I, as I spoke about in my New York Post piece yesterday, I mean, some of, the, some of these uh, 
concerned issues that may or may not have, have even been wrong-headed, let alone criminal, but of course he was able to reshape some of these industries. And some of the unintended consequences of, of these actions were, were pretty severe. When you throw out the longtime CEO of the largest insurer, AIG, and then in the next nine months they write as many credit default swaps as they had in the prior seven years, I think that that sends up a warning bell that maybe uh, we don't want that type of aggressive action from, um, from prosecutors and politicians that are, that are running the state AG's office. Uh, I want to emphasize that, that since Spencer's left office, we've still seen the Martin Act used as the primary vehicle uh, for AGs to come in and, and try to reshape business activities. So under Attorney General Cuomo, we saw uh, energy companies targeted over their assessments of climate change. Uh, we've seen that again with Eric Schneiderman as Attorney General, looking at energy companies and, and their projections about natural gas fracking. Uh, so we've got a, a broad expansion in AG authority under the Martin Act, which, which and, and as Jim McGuire may talk about later, AG authority is, is traditionally cabined in New York. They don't have general uh, uh, criminal enforcement authority, but, but they, they get it through this Martin Act hook and have, have substantially uh, expanded their power since Spitzer really brought the Martin Act out beyond the mere blue sky law uh, original intent. There have been some calls to expand the Martin Act, uh, including creating a private right of action. Uh, this has largely been limited in the, in the calls to the New York pension funds. Eric Schneiderman was one of the leaders of that when he was in the State Assembly. Uh, there's been a push from Manhattan DA. The district attorneys don't have civil subpoena authority, but they do have criminal enforcement authority under the Martin Act, and so we've seen Cy Vance uh, pushing for both greater penalties and greater sweep to the Martin Act, trying to wrap in insider trading and other, other sorts of issues that are uh, uh, the headlines today under the Martin Act scope. And, and a significant legal development last December, uh, this is a, a private legal development, but the New York uh, Court of Appeals uh, in Assured Guarantee v. J.P. Morgan uh, ruled that the, the Martin Act does not preclude or preempt other common law fraud, uh, private rights of action. So while the Martin Act itself doesn't uh, generate private rights of action, it also doesn't preclude common law private rights of action. And, and many observers and, and, and certain judges had assumed that it had in the past, uh, but the Court of Appeals resolved that, uh, which means that we probably will see more civil litigation in the securities docket founded on state law here in New York, given that the, the, the Supreme Court of the United States and the Congress have tightened uh, the federal uh, securities, uh, uh, securities civil docket. So at this point in time, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, whom we're very honored to have here today, and that's the Honorable Robert S. Smith, uh, an associate judge on New York's highest court, its Court of Appeals. Uh, he is a graduate of Stanford and the Columbia Law School, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Law Review and spent 35 years in private legal practice for the Paul Weiss firm, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. Uh, in 2003, he left Paul Weiss, and in November of that year was appointed, uh, January of 2004 confirmed, uh, to the New York Court of Appeals, appointed by Governor George Pataki. So we look forward to your thoughts on these topics and others and any other legal wisdom you care to share. Let's give a hearty welcome to Judge Robert Smith. Well, thank you. And uh, I now confront the, the problem that I, uh, I had when I was first asked to give this talk. What can I possibly tell you about uh, overcriminalization? because I have at best, a, in the, the job I have, a rather limited perspective on the topic you're, you're concerned with uh, today. Uh, the, uh, I can't see, yeah, the, the problem is uh, by its nature to a very large extent uh, an extra judicial one in the sense that uh, what, um, uh, what prosecutors are accused of doing in many, many cases is using uh, 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 perhaps marginal criminal cases to force settlements, to get pleas, to resolve, uh, resolve matters outside the courts, uh, a way, a use of the criminal law that may or may not be legitimate, but in any event, it's not something by its nature that I'm ever going to see because it's never going to get to probably to any court and certainly not uh, to an appellate court. Uh, it's maybe for that reason 
is that when I uh, start, yeah, I tried to think back of uh, on a case in which uh, that I had seen or that I had worked on in which uh, it crossed my mind that the conduct being prosecuted should not be criminal. And I can't think of one. I can think of cases in which I had some doubt as to whether the, the defendant did what he was accused of doing. I can't think of a case in which I said to myself, uh, Gee, this, this, this should not be a criminal matter. This should be handled civilly. Uh, that's yeah, the one difference between the state and federal courts is we get our fair share of, of real crime. We got a lot of, of uh, in fact, yeah, if you become a judge, you, you, you get the impression that nothing ever happens in the state of New York except ghastly murders and sexual abuse. It's a, it's a horrible state we live in. Um, the, um, uh, so I, um, uh, and I have, uh, uh, as far as I remember, I have yet to see, in any case, a, a criminal case brought under the Martin Act, which I guess is consistent with the the criticisms that have been made of, of the use of the Martin Act, that it's uh, that the uh, 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 attorneys general and others have been accused of uh, 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 stirring up investigations and threatened prosecutions that never see the light of day, never come to trial, uh, but have a, a considerable interorum effect. Um, so uh, that's that's what I'm not going to talk about because I don't know anything about it. Uh, I, uh, I, it occurred to me that I could talk a little about um, the way in which real crimes, uh, uh, crime, things that everybody uh, knows are crimes, are prosecuted uh, that, that may or may not uh, teach something about this problem of uh, overcriminalization. So I'm going to tell, I hope, in fairly brief uh, uh, space, uh, a couple of stories uh, with, with two morals. Uh, the moral, the the, uh, uh, the first moral being prosecutors will take what you give them, uh, and the other being that there are uh, are some issues that are just so emotional that the the uh, the, uh, the criminal law is uh, is going to be affected, and you, you the best thing you can do is get out of the way. Um, the the first story is is about uh, something called depraved indifference murder, uh, which probably for those of you who are uh, uh, civil or white collar practitioners you don't run into every day, uh, but um, the and it's it's a subject that it is possible to talk about forever, and I feel as though I have talked about it forever in my years on the court. But uh, the 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 very brief summary is that there is a kind of non intentional act that is really just as bad as intentional murder. Uh, the classic cases are the guy who opens the, the lion's cage at the zoo or burns down a building not knowing whether there are people inside. Uh, they have perfectly depraved, vicious acts which show not, uh, 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 not, not an intent to kill but an indifference to human life and that are punished as murder. And this goes back at least to the early 19th century, probably further than that, and it's very well established. Uh, in, the, in the early 1980s, uh, that uh, um, uh, our court took what I, I guess we eventually uh, uh, acknowledged uh, was a very strange turn that led to a remarkable expansion of this, uh, this rather narrow category uh, of murder in a case called People Against Register, which was really mainly focused on whether it was an intoxication defense. Um, we, um, uh, we held that uh, 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 it, yeah, th there was no intoxication defense to depraved indifference murder because depraved indifference is not a state of mind. I have, we have, there are a million cases saying that. I have never understood it. How can depraved, how can you be depraved anywhere except in your mind? I haven't got the slightest idea, uh, but we said it. Uh, depraved indifference is not a state of mind. It's a set of objective circumstances. Uh, there are certain, uh, uh, since the, the, the view, the words of the statute were circumstances evincing, whatever evincing means, a depraved indifference to human life. And so we said, well, nothing to do with the state of mind. It's not a mens rea. So this is a rather odd example of the attenuation of the mens rea requirement. It's all a matter of circumstance. This got translated, don't ask me exactly how, uh, into the theory that almost anything could be depraved indifference murder. And prosecutors got in the habit over the next couple of decades of throwing a depraved indifference uh, count 
uh, into every murder case, uh, uh, virtually every murder case. If you got indicted for murder, you would have two counts, one of intentional murder, the other of depraved indifference. I think that the worry was generally that you never know what the defendant's going to say, you never know what the jury's going to think. They may have juries say, well, you can't see into a man's mind, you don't know what he really intended. So they, they, they took the alternative saying, well, even if he didn't intend to kill him, he must have been depravedly indifferent or he wouldn't have killed him. And uh, a lot of those cases got brought, the so-called high-end depraved indifference cases. There were also the so-called low-end depraved indifference cases in which uh, I think were really just a way of, uh, of uh, charging up a manslaughter case. That is, someone who obviously hadn't really intended to kill anyone and wasn't particularly depraved if, as, as depravity goes, but uh, who, yeah, who, who, could be, who might be persuaded uh, to, uh, to plead uh, to, to manslaughter if you could uh, throw a murder count. And we had, uh, uh, we had a case of a, uh, uh, th th these are all very strange and bizarre cases of a woman who went to confront her boyfriend over child support, uh, pulled out a gun, shot him, and as soon as he hit the ground, pulled out her cell phone, called 911, and waited till the ambulance came. I don't know, yeah, what was going on, uh, I don't have the slightest idea, but depraved indifference doesn't sound like the right term for her, but she was indicted and convicted of depraved indifference murder with no charge of intentional murder. The, the prosecution did not try to prove that she intended to kill him. Uh, these cases got, uh, I guess I should say, weirder and weirder and eventually uh, began to, um, uh, to cause uh, our court to cut back on them. Uh, I, for me, the, the high watermark was a case in which a guy walked into a barber shop, uh, uh, saw somebody who he didn't like, uh, shot, him off, uh, 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 shot him in the face. The guy fell to the, uh, to the ground. He stood over him and shot him some more. The guy was found with ten, ten bullets in various parts of his uh, body. The jury acquits him of intentional murder and, uh, and convicts him of depraved indifference murder. And of course, the scary thing is that what we thought we had to do in that case, we had to reverse the depraved indifference murder conviction because, come on, uh, this was not depraved indifference. And uh, he'd already been acquitted of intentional murder, so there's an innocent man. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that, that was a very serious problem and, 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 and yeah, led a lot of us to, to, feel, yeah, to, to worry a lot about how we could cut back on depraved indifference murder. Ultimately, we did. Depraved indifference, you'll be happy to hear, is now a state of mind. And um, while we still, we still struggle with, uh, with cases, uh, some be, uh, now I think uh, maybe shading into the second point I'm going to make, uh, the, the, issue under the, issue, the depraved indifference murder issues now tend to come in cases that, that really arouse the emotions even more than the average murder case. It's one thing to have a someone kill someone out of sexual jealousy or a drug dealer kill a drug dealer or whatever it is not that we don't not that they aren't taken very seriously but was, you know when a when a drug dri when a drunk driver kills a young mother crossing the street or when a uh, when a, a child abuser kills a baby uh, the emotions really begin to flow uh, and in those cases there's yeah uh, the the, the yeah, the, temp the temptation to say, well, even if you can't prove intention, there was depraved indifference here, is uh, is very much there, and perhaps sometimes uh, sometimes rightly, but that um, that is where that uh, area of the law has gone. Uh, another, um, the other uh, uh, cheerful subject I have to talk to you about uh, is. Um, is uh, uh, is sex um, uh, the um, because I'm talking about things that uh, that arouse emotional reactions and the and suggesting to you that there are some uh, some subject matters for which people and meaning voters and therefore the politicians they elect uh, react very very strongly and intensely uh, and you can't always tell them well look maybe the uh, the the uh, aggressive use of the criminal law isn't the absolutely best way to handle this. Uh, uh, sex offenses of various kinds are treated and you know, are given kind of special treatment in many ways under New York law. Laws that are in form not criminal but obviously closely related to the criminal law. We have a Sex Offender Registration Act so that if you have committed a sex offense your, your address and your picture may be uh, uh, online forever. Uh, as a uh, as a sex offender, uh, uh, if you you know if you committed 
armed robbery or assault, no such thing, of course. But people get very, yeah, people get scared about sexual predators. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I do myself. Uh, we have a Sex Offender Management and Treatment Act, also in form a civil uh, statute, which essentially says that if uh, uh, a really bad sex, well, it doesn't say that, but the way it is sometimes seems to be applied is that if a really bad sex offender has served his maximum term and you don't really want to let him go, you can civilly commit him until he gets better. And it may be a long time before he gets better. I quite understand the impulse to keep these guys locked up. I, I have and I have expressed some unease about what the constitutional limits might be on, on the power simply to, uh, to lock people up because you're afraid of them. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the area on which, I, uh, which we've most recently uh, uh, got into and which I uh, wanted, to, wanted to mention to you is, uh, is child pornography. A, uh, this is, and you know, it seems in a way very strange to talk about overcriminalization when you're talking about child pornography because everyone's natural reaction is this is the most vicious, awful thing you could imagine. I mean, this is the, the, the yeah, the, these are uh, people who uh, take real children, young children, and pose them in the most ghastly uh, uh, pictures and videos uh, uh, in order to make money off it. It's a ha little hard to imagine anything more disgusting or one that, 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 that uh, produces a more intense emotional reaction. And of course, that's the problem. Uh, the, 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 there, there are some things that are just so, uh, 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 so outrageous uh, that you, um, uh, it's hard to know uh, when you're overreacting and when you're not or if there is such a thing as an overreaction. Uh, the problem with child pornography is it's very, very hard to get the pornographers. I mean, I think I have a feeling half of them are in the Ukraine and the other half are, 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 are hard to get. And the, uh, the way, the obvious way that the legislature has sought uh, to stamp out the evil is by punishing the consumer. Uh, and so that if you, uh, if you have the perverse, uh, sick taste of watching child porn, even if you have, would never even think of doing anything bad, of actually doing anything bad to a real kid, you can be in very, very serious trouble. I think, uh, I think we do not, I have the impression, I haven't studied the federal law on this, but I have the strong impression that in general the, the, uh, the federal law is if they catch you, they melt the key. Uh, if um, the, the state law is, is not that uh, severe, but we have, um, it, is, um, it is a D felony to promote child pornography, and D felony punishable up to, up to seven years, you can, which in itself doesn't sound like, an over, like overdoing it. Uh, our court held a number of years ago that you promote child pornography uh, if you obtain uh, any, uh, a, uh, any child, uh, 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 any piece of ch any, any pornographic material any, any uh, that depicts a child. That is, that uh, uh, the the, yeah, the word promote is is defined in the statute by using the word procure, and we define procure to mean get or obtain. So that anybody who buys a book or a, a picture or a picture, or uh, accepts as a gift or picks up off the ground intentionally with the the intention of of, of using it. Uh, has has is guilty of the of the D felony of promoting child pornography, perhaps a rather stringent uh, approach. Uh, we had quite recently the case of how all this applies uh, to people who uh, sit uh, in front of their computers looking at child pornography uh, and who do nothing else, uh, but who, in the case I'm thinking of, do obviously do quite a lot of that. Uh, you can certainly understand that these people. Are, are punishable, you know, both uh, as a practical matter because how else are you going to uh, uh, eliminate this problem if you can't attack the consumer? And as a moral matter, these people should realize that they're, they're contributing, they're providing a market for the exploitation of the children. Um, on the other hand, it, I, I at least am sometimes able to, to, to find people like that more, more pathetic than really evil. Uh, and to, to understand that a, it's a natural human tendency to think that if you're only staring at your computer, you're not really hurting anybody, uh, especially in cases uh, where, uh, you haven't, where you haven't paid for the material you're getting. There's material that's available for free, uh, and the law makes no distinction. Uh, it, it doesn't matter 
uh, whether you pay for it or not. Uh, we had the issue uh, of whether uh, just looking at the uh, at the image on the on your uh, calling up and looking intentionally at at the uh, pornographic image on the screen of whether that uh, is possession or possessing or procuring and therefore promoting child pornography. Uh, if the answer is yes, then just by click yeah, by one click of a mouse, you can be subject to seven years in prison. Uh, and we held um, uh, in uh, the and okay, it was, I think it was six of us, uh, uh, no, maybe I guess five of us, uh, uh, with the majority, two concurring on other grounds. Uh, we held that that's not uh, possessing or procuring, that you have to actually print it or download it or something like that, or you have to knowingly store it uh, on your computer. Uh, but just looking at it uh, doesn't do it. Uh, this uh, produced uh, uh, two concurring opinions. One was mine. But the, uh, I wrote it only because I was responding to one of my colleagues' concurrences in which she said, effectively, this is an outrage. Uh, the uh, uh, child pornography is an awful thing. Uh, the, um, the obvious uh, intention of the legislature and the obvious right thing to do is to pursue it as aggressively as you possibly can. Uh, and uh, the legislature ought to immediately act to change the law. I wrote a concurrence of my own answering hers, saying, in effect, I'm not so sure. Uh, the, uh, pr the attempt to wipe out an evil by aggressive targeting of the consumers does not have a totally successful history with the drug laws and uh, might, uh, uh, might, might not work in this case. And there, there, is, there is surely such a thing as too much uh, in, uh, as to how long you're going to send to jail a, a, a poor, what you might consider a poor sick guy who is doing nothing except looking at, looking at pictures on his computer screen. Uh, you may guess which of the two concurring opinions got uh, more attention from the politicians. Uh, a, a bill to stiffen the statute uh, and, and, and uh, um, passed uh, you know, uh, almost instantaneously through at least one house of the legislature. I thought, yeah, I, 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 I think that the... Uh, yeah, I, I don't think the people went to sleep before they had introduced the legislation after they read the opinion. I have not kept track of exactly where it stands, but I'm reasonably confident that you will see uh, a stronger uh, a prosecution of child pornography. And maybe it's a good thing, but it makes me nervous, and in, as a general proposition, and I guess that's what I'll close with, it, it makes me nervous when... Uh, 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 Hu yeah, the normal human outrage at an uh, uh, at an obvious evil uh, becomes so intense that maybe people don't pause for thought, and that may have something to do with overcriminalization. And why don't I spend the rest of my time taking any questions you've got? S so, do we have audience questions? Yes, in the back. Please wait for your microphone and, and introduce yourself. Thanks. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is William Nisley. I'm a private attorney in Manhattan. I, I work in the Chinatown area. And one thing hit me when you're talking about the last comment is in Chinatown, they obviously sell knockoff handbags. And then recently there was a city councilwoman, Margaret Chin, wanted to put something in the law to criminalize the tourists coming in to buy the handbags. So this certainly hit me as a very similar analogy to what you were making, the criminalization of the actual consumer. Obviously, there certainly would, was an outrage about that, and, and I don't think such a bill would ever pass, but it certainly highlights what you were saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, and I, I don't mean to say, first of all, I'm not, I don't really think anything, because I can't have any opinions, I'm a judge. Uh, and uh, and, and even, even apart, yeah, I'm, I'm only raising questions. Uh, but, but, but even apart from that, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that there are never times to uh, – that the, the prosecuting the consumer is always wrong. I mean, I don't know. It's a hard problem. Uh, certainly, it's uh, – uh, uh, when you talk about prostitution, uh, uh, many people have long been offended that it's only the prostitute who is punished and not, and not her client. Uh, it's uh, – yeah, it's, it's tricky. But the uh, yeah the, yeah, 
but it does, I suppose your example does illustrate the same problem in a much less emotional context. You're a tourist walking through Chinatown. Someone offers you a, uh, a what a Gucci bag for uh, for seven dollars and ninety five cents. Uh, you don't really think that you're doing a terribly immoral thing by buying it. Uh, you may uh, maybe you are. You can make a logical case that this is a, you are clearly part of a conspiracy to undermine Gucci's valuable private property. But you know, most most people just don't think that way, and sometimes it's a problem when the law gets too far from you know, it takes you know, it pursues logic uh, to a point that excludes what um, the the way people actually think. Yeah. Yes, over here again. Again, please wait, Judge Gazay, for the. I'm a federal district judge, and uh, the things you said about the. Uh, child pornography and and I'll echo what uh, I don't want to repeat what you've said but <laughs> I want to second oh, go, go ahead yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 can have a, a somewhat mentally sick middle-aged businessman with a good family and he watches some child pornography and of course the FBI is the girl on the other end and he gets arrested, and he can be subject. You talk about melting the key. The penalties are horrendous. And uh, I won't disclose what I try to do to avoid that. <laughs> what, uh, d what I, but, uh, and also this thing about registering. Uh, I have a fellow who's before me in a federal crime, uh, but he's involved in registering as a sex offender. It ruins his life. And, you know, those of us who believe in rehabilitation, who believe that there is a, you pay your debt to society and it should be over with, that, that obviously society has its reasons. But if there's any possibility of doing some reconsidering in these areas, at least uh, I'm very happy to hear your remarks and, and you're a prestigious judge, and, and it's very interesting to hear your remarks, and maybe someday there'll be some reconsideration. Oh, thank you. I've, I've, I've heard from an, an even more prestigious judge of even more experience. Thanks. Yes. It, it, uh, in, in the back here, please, uh, again, wait for the microphone and identify yourself for the camera. <laughs> the prior question was from, from U.S. Federal District um, Judge Tom Grizzell. Okay, is this working? Yes. I'm Malvina Nathanson. I'm in private practice. This may, again, be more of a comment than a question. Um, but the child pornography, federal child pornography cases, um, fa found them ra rather uh, enlightening. The federal judges are beginning to uh, raise questions about the statutes, the, the penalties and the statutes and the guidelines. Um, ranges for those penalties on the grounds that nobody has, that they are not in any way based on an analysis of the relationship between the conduct to be deterred and the criminal penalty imposed, whether it's in any way efficacious for that purpose or whether something else would be more efficacious. Um, this is also something that we very rarely see in the state courts, uh, in the state legislature. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, I, I, I also very rarely see that in court decisions. Um, is that something that the court should be looking at as they analyze whether particular statutes should be interpreted in particular ways? Well, um, I mean obviously in, in a way you raise the very broad philosophical question of what a court should look at. Um, I, I, I at least start from the premise that these, the legislature is allowed to do to to, to decide these things, uh, and it's allowed to commit folly if it wants to commit folly. Uh, and if we don't like what the legislature has done, uh, I don't think it's for us uh, to try to undermine um, uh, uh, that uh, yeah that policy. Uh, judges are human; uh, they do uh, when when there's a fair doubt 
about what the legislature intended. You are allowed to think, well, the legislature, we, we assume, whether true or not, we, we uh, are entitled to assume the legislature was wise and judicious and all-seeing, and therefore that means that they agreed with me, and therefore uh, I, will, uh, I, I will interpret the statute uh, in the way that I think uh, produces the best uh, policy result or does the least harm. And I, 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 I am sure there's not a judge in the world who doesn't do that. So to that extent, uh, if I understand your question, I guess the answer is yes, judges do uh, 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 take into account whether they think uh, a particular, well, it's a good idea to be uh, more aggressive or less aggressive in prosecuting and punishing certain kinds of crime. But we also, I hope, try to remember it's not our decision. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're just trying to carry out the legislature's will. Yes, Roger in the back. Please wait again for the mic and identify yourself. Uh, good morning, Judge. Uh, my name is Roger Moak. I'm a retired lawyer and an arbitrator here in the city. Um, I, I, have a, I know you're not allowed to have uh, political opinions, so if you can't answer this, then Jim, maybe Jim Copeland can answer this. I have an alternative theory to the too many laws uh, theory, and that is there's something wrong with the Office of Attorney General itself. Uh, it's my opinion that I think some 40 of the state attorneys general are elected, and the moment they're elected attorney general, they're running for governor or senator. And whether or not there is uh, a problem that anybody's complaining about or not, there is a tendency for them to look around, see if they find and they can find an issue that they want to deal with and run with it uh, uh, in uh, the quest for votes for the next office that they're running for. So uh, just in case you can't respond to that uh, theory, maybe Jim can. Well, I'm not, I obviously can't. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to denounce any attorneys general. Uh, <laughs> I, um, and I'm, I'm sure yeah, may, may, maybe Jim will, uh, 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 will want to respond to it. It occurs to me, uh, obviously, there is the problem of political publicity-hungry prosecutors is a problem that does exist. It is not confined uh, to attorneys general. Uh, and it's I uh, just impressionistically, it's hard for me to make generalizations. DAs are elected too, and there have been some DAs who have been pretty outrageous, and there have been some pretty good, and still are some pretty good conscientious uh, elected uh, DAs. There have been some uh, appointed federal prosecutors who are not shy of uh, of, of uh, bringing prosecutions that get their picture in the paper, uh, and uh, and paint them as as. Uh, uh, as gladiators. Uh, okay, uh, d uh, d uh, d Jim, do you want to? Uh I, I, I basically agree with everything you just said. And I, I, I do think there's a problem with uh, state attorneys general. I, I've detailed this last year in a report in our Trial Lawyers, Inc. series on the civil and the criminal side, uh, but we clearly also see it with non-elected federal prosecutors. I just wrote a report last month on federal deferred prosecution agreement and non-prosecution agreements, and, and so I, I agree with everything the judge said. Do we have other questions? In that case, I want to thank Judge Smith. <laughs> and we'll go right toward our panel. So if our panelists could make our way to the front. Thanks. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.